Scott Strawn. I'm the county agent ag over in Ockletree County. And just to set this up for Pat, uh, first of all, I think uh, Steve did a great job as far as looking at the economics of irrigation scheduling. And uh, anyway, just to give you a history and a little bit of background, so it'll set this up for Pat. Uh, I've been Asian over in Ockletree County since 94. And I actually grew up on an irrigated farm just north of Spearman. And uh, anyway, I'm glad there wasn't Facebook back in those days because you could probably catch me swimming as a kid in an irrigation ditch. And of course, we've come a long ways. You know, we've got all these, uh, we don't, we're old water anymore. It's all center pivots. But over time, you know, in 94 when I moved there, the average corn yield for the county was 140 bushels. And I remember in the 70s, my dad grew a 150 bushel mm -hmm. corn crop and everybody around Spearman was calling him King Corn. My uncle down in Bovina row watered corn in the 70s and in, in 74, he won a national corn growers yield contest with 215 bushel corn nationwide. And so anyway, um, fast forward, Going to field days and stuff, we start to see these hybrids come on the market. And of course our corn yields are going up, up, up. Hearing these uh, uh, corn breeders talking about, you know, more drought tolerant type corns. And uh, one of the producers there, a good friend of mine, he's on this water district board is Dan Crinky. And we got to talking a lot uh, about the corn yields going up. We see this new technology and you know, row water's going away. We start asking ourselves, you know, could we actually save irrigations on corn? Because at the time, and what I was used to is you planted that corn and then you turn on the wells and at the end of the summer, you shut them off. You know, you just ran full blast. And we're still kind of close to that, but really um, Steve's work showed that, hey, we can start messing with the timing. And so we started talking about it. And uh, when I say we, the growers, the county agents, uh, our irrigation <laughs> specialists, and uh, got with the North Plains Groundwater Conservation District and they sponsored a project called EPIC. And uh, the county agents implemented the project with producers, but EPIC stands for Efficient, uh, oh gosh, Profitability in Corn, uh, Irrigation in Corn. And uh, anyway, your reports are in your notebook. There's three years report. And in a nutshell, uh, we went to each, each of the agents had a, a cooperating producer that had a circle of corn. And we used uh, some tools, because that's the first thing is, okay, if I'm gonna start trying to figure out when to irrigate and how much and when to stop irrigating, I need some tools. We see that it's profitable to do this, but I need a tool. So this is where Aqua Planner comes in and, and Pat's gonna explain how that works. We also use Aqua Spy, you know, soil moisture monitoring and uh, equipment at that time was David Sloan. And so half that circle, the agents, the, the farmer agreed to uh, turn that over to us to manage. They would be blind to using this equipment. We would tell them when to irrigate that half of the circle, how much, when. The producer used the other half, just however he normally did it. What we found was in most, after three years, um, anywhere from one to eight inches of irrigation savings. Now, I know that doesn't seem much, but when you start looking at the numbers, like Steve showed us, it's economic to do that. Another thing that was interesting, and the crop physiologist could probably explain it, but we saw yield increases too. And we were on the side of irrigation where we're still going full tilt. And we just wanted to see if, you know, at that time, 900,000 acres of corn planted in the North Panhandle if we can say one in, acre inch, you know, that's a million acre inches. That's a lot of water across the whole district. Well, we did find out using these technologies, we could do that. But it, the interesting thing is we were getting yield bumps too, and anywhere from two to 12 bushels per acre. So again, that made it even more profitable to look at. So I'm gonna turn this over to Pat now, but again, the question was, was there a time when we could shut off? Or what time to start up, when to shut off? And usually in between, we didn't have much wiggle room, but I think those are still questions that are asked. And this is also applicable to cotton.
because you can look at the curve that Jordan showed on crop water use and other crops. And so I want to turn this over to Pat now and he's going to explain the aqua planter uh, and how we utilize that or how it can be utilized uh, with those kind of questions. Any questions for me? Anyway, those reports are in your notebooks. If you, the agents that implemented these are still in their respective counties, believe it or not. And so if you have questions, call one of the agents and we can talk to you more about this equipment. Because we, although these trials weren't replicated and all that, we did them enough years, I think we're onto something. And I think they really back up to some of the research that was done like in 212 and that sort of thing. So anyway, I'm gonna sit down and shut up because uh, Pat really has the cool tool here that can be used in helping answer these questions. Okay, my name's Pat Scar. Uh, I had, had the privilege of growing up up in Sherman County on an open ditch and gated pipe irrigation farm. Uh, went to Tech, got a degree in ag engineering. I uh, graduated in 74. Mike? Say up or yeah, move it up. Yes. Move it up. Just move it up or make sure that it's on. Okay. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, 74, I spent a couple of years in the Army at the Corps of Engineers Research Center in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Uh, <clears throat> while we were there, my dad bought a farm over at Tex Line and asked me to come help him farm. And uh, it was a, uh, had seven water drive sprinklers on it. And I just, you know, I got really excited about that deal. And so uh, we, uh, <clears throat> There's a little research lab there in a research library in, at, on the station. And I'd, I'd go over there after work a lot of times and uh, I, I, I copied off every paper, every research paper ever that I could find on irrigation management. And I come out of there with the, the uh, conclusion that the soil water balance was the best irrigation management tool available. And so when I got home, I built a, an evaporation pan. Uh, David Reiner showed y'all one of those last week. And uh, I, was, I, was, I was collecting pan evaporation data every day and uh, applying the crop coefficients to it and maintaining a water balance on all of our fields. And that was, so I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, let's think a little bit about what management is. Management is setting goals and objectives, is knowing the re resources available to work with and having expectations of future conditions, and in developing a plan to achieve those goals, and then you have to execute it. That's two different deals. I should have made two different points out of that. But we have, have to have a plan and we have to have execute it. Uh, so, and we're gonna show here that Aquaplanner is the ultimate irrigation management tool because it does all of that. It does all of that. <clears throat> so, but let's take a road trip. <clears throat> I had the opportunity this last fall to drive all the way from Amarillo. I didn't go all the way to Seattle. I, would, I stopped, I got, had a job right up here, but, but I, got, I got to drive that. And so, what do you think you need for a successful road trip? What are some of the things you need? Some things you might not think about, uh, just take for granted, you need Google Maps for one, okay? You need a map to know where you're going, and you need a fuel gauge. A fuel gauge that you have faith in. I had a, I bought a new car, and I was up in uh, Kansas coming home and uh, got to Hugoton and looked at the gas gauge and did the math, figured up, I think I can get to Guyman. I liked about six miles. <laughs> <laughs> and, but you have to have a fuel gauge that you can trust, that you have faith in. These are, uh, I found these on the internet. These are some Model T fuel gauges. Aren't you glad we've progressed past that? Aren't you glad we've progressed past dipsticks? And then 
man, I just love them. I pick up, or y'all got them too, I'm sure, but this fuel range indicator. How many miles you got before you need to fill up? Isn't that handy? That is super neat. Uh, and then we've got Gas Buddy. Gas Buddy can tell us where we need to, where the best deals are on gasoline. And so we can, where the, so, <clears throat> and so, but I got to thinking about this, and the ultimate trip management tool would include all of these in one simple user friendly app. One simple user friendly app. It would know at all times how much fuel we had in our tank. It would calculate the fuel usage rates for each mile. You know, it, with this map would be a 3D map, so it would calculate the elevation change, and it also have a wind speed and direction forecast taken into consideration, so it could calculate the exact fuel usage we're going to be encountering, and and it would also consider the cost of that fuel and tell us where we need to fill up. And it could do this before we take off, before we leave, and then it would adjust every, uh, as we progress down the trip, as conditions change, it would adjust. <clears throat> so that would be pretty, I thought that would be the, the ultimate, ultimate guy. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> irrigation management is not a lot different than fuel management on a long trip in the, uh, for uh, the trip, we've got a fuel tank on the soil and the irrigation. We've got a soil profile. We've got evapotranspiration. We've got fuel consumption rate. We've got <clears throat> a map and the terrain change. And over here, we've got historical precipitation and evapotranspiration that we can use. And then we've got forecast evapotranspiration and precipitation we can use. And we know what our water cost and we also know what <clears throat> our yield loss is for each water, for, for what our cost and yield is for missing, uh, uh, for running out of gas. But, <clears throat> so y'all seen these maps, everybody's shown one <laughs> this week or today and last week, but the soil has only so much water holding capacity only so much water holding capacity and we've broken that down into two categories we we're talking about plant available water and we've got readily available water this this green area that's the amount of water that's <clears throat> that's readily available to the, so, to the plant and then after it gets down to about 50 percent <coughs> that water it gets hard to take up out of the soil and, this, and the, the plant will start, start suffering. Uh, yeah, and this is, you know, silty clay loam are, are, has more available water to it than a, than a coarse sand. Y'all seen this before. Y'all seen this graph. Everybody's had it, I think. <coughs> so basically, what it boils down to, <coughs> we've got, in our soils in this area, we have about two and a half two and a quarter to two inches of, of water available, of this available plant water, or, a, or essentially just about an inch of readily available water per foot, per foot of, of profile. Now, that the sand, some of the coarser sands on the west side, uh, there'll be a little bit less than that. <clears throat> uh, so, you all seen graphs like this, but this is the water flowing down through that with gravitational water. The water just flows down through the soil between the particles and in the channels in the soil. And then over here, then, then it, it, when that water stops flowing, it's called capillary water. And this water is available to the roots of the, the plant. <coughs> and until that water gets so tightly held by the particles that the plant it, it's not going to move through the soil. This this water will move through the soil uh, by capillary action. <clears throat> uh, 
Now, our fuel tank size varies during the season. Well, let me put it back, let me back it up. Our fuel tank size is constant during the season. For instance, we use four foot of profile for corn, <clears throat> and, uh, but only when we get started early in the season, very little of that tank is available to us. And so we have to manage both the fuel in that is available to our, our crop and the fuel that's not available to our crop that's below the root zone. Also, <clears throat> uh, this root zone is, is gonna be fully established by the time the plants uh, tassels or blooms, whether if it's, but when, you, when, a, when a plant blooms, <clears throat> it's, uh, its root zone is as deep as it's gonna get, basically, effectively, and the root density is as dense as it's gonna get. It's not gonna change after that. It's just gonna kind of maintain that root density until the plant matures. <clears throat> Uh, also, when the plant is pulling water from this root zone, it's going to take 40% from the, of the moisture from the top 25% of the profile. Now, that, I mean, if, we, if we're back here at 40 days and we just got a two foot root zone, effective root zone, but 40% of that's going to come out of the top six inches, what that means. <clears throat> And so, and 30% from the second, 25%, and 20%, and 10%. Now, <clears throat> when we're irrigating through the season, we are constantly replenishing the water in these top two zones. So, nearly all the water we're going to use during the crop year is going to come out of these top two feet. The, the bottom two, bottom half of the root zone. It's just kind of storage for <clears throat> uh, uh, okay <clears throat> uh, so soils in our area hold about two inches of, of water per foot uh, half of this is readily available and running the tank below 50% is gonna result in yield loss. Does that make sense? <clears throat> okay, uh, let's talk about our fuel delivery system. Now, Jordan, is she still in here? Yeah, I got a lot of questions. <laughs> now, the textbooks say that the water moves through the plants by less negative soil moisture tension. And so, this graph is showing that the soil moisture tension in the soil is minus three to minus 15 bars. Mm -hmm. Jordan, what is a bar? So, uh, I guess a, a unit of pressure. So, you can actually convert a bar to a PSI. So, we think PSI is what we're talking about, you know, air pressure. And so, that it's just a unit of pressure. And okay. So, so, I Googled that, and it comes, you know, and that, and that was. A, a one bar was 14.5 PSI. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Right. Huge. Anyway. Mm -hmm. so, that, so, and so the tension in the roots, they say, is from 3 to minus 20. So the, the, the roots are sucking this moisture out of the soil. And then up in the leaves, it's 15 to 30 bars. <coughs> And so those leaves are pulling the moisture up out of, from the roots. And the atmosphere is minus 50 bars. That's 7,000 PSI? Yeah. Wow. Anyway, but that's, that's, that's awesome. Anyway, but I think there's something else going on here. I used to raise lettuce on my back porch and hide with hydroponics. And one day I went out, for, I went to fix lunch, didn't have any lettuce. So what do you do? You just grab a pair of scissors, go out on the back porch and chunk, pull off a head of lettuce. 
And then something amazing uh, uh, blew me away started happening. Out of the, that stump of that, that root, or that, that stump of that lettuce plant, water started oozing out of there. And so, and then, you know, it was pulling water up from those roots or about five inches down to the water in that, that, where those plants were growing. And so something was pumping water up and pushing it out of the top of that, that root. And it wasn't capillary action. Capillary action won't push it past the top of the tube. It wasn't wicking. It, uh, something was pushing that water up. And it, I'm, if I'm invited back to do this next year, I'll have that documented. I'll have some pictures. But <clears throat> something else is going on, looks to me like, <clears throat> from an engineering point of view. <clears throat> And let's talk about these this root a little bit. <clears throat> these root hairs, this root grows about a centimeter a day. Centimeter is about three eighths of an inch. These root this root grows about three inch a centimeter a day. <clears throat> and these root hairs only exist in the last one or one and a half centimeters. All that plant water is being pulled up by root hairs that exist on the very tips of the roots. <coughs> These root, they, and this root here is growing a centimeter a day. These root hairs only last, one, live one or two days. And so the plant is constantly renewing, growing, constantly renewing or growing roots in length and replacing root hairs. It's, it's constantly doing that. <clears throat> and I asked Mike last last week, is there anything we can do to affect as root hair or root development? You know, root. And the only thing I picked up from his conversation or his presentation and, and Jordan's was we, we can Variety is one thing. Compaction, reducing compaction, is a, is about the only other thing. <clears throat> uh, so then, and this uh, this picture shows kind of how this this works. You've got this root here out here, and it's and there's water and all these soil particles, and <clears throat> And you've got these little pockets of air. And as this root starts pulling this water up, these air bubbles will expand and eventually it'll break the cycle. It'll break the suction. It's just like getting an air bubble in your I mean, the old siphon tubes. They, they, they'll quit. So these air bubbles disrupt that, that movement of that soil, of that water to the root. And so that's why when you get down to you re, you pull fifty percent of the of the uh, available water out. You replace that with air. The plants can't move that water. That water will not move to the root hairs, and that's why the plant is suffering moisture stress. <clears throat> uh, so root growth is regulated by heat units. I mean, it's just. Uh, it's just kind of a straight line by heat units until you get to flowering. <clears throat> and but roots grow where there is moisture in the soil. It, it, you know, Mike gave us those pressures. How much pressure this it was taken for a root to grow at diff under different conditions. <clears throat> and these soil moisture probes that we use uh, to check the moisture with. You can just think of. You know, when the soil is really dry, how hard it is to push that probe in, the root is experiencing the same difficulty. The same difficulty. <clears throat> uh, okay. Uh, we've talked about this. Root hairs grow at about a centimeter of, of life. Uh, does anybody have any questions on any of this stuff? Roots need oxygen. They can't survive when the 
when the water's with in and when they're inundated. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. <clears throat> we talked about water moving through the soil by gravity and by capillary action, but also roots. Mike mentioned this, or one of the guys mentioned this last week. But roots will move water from an area that is moist to an area that's dry. Uh, I remember one paper I read where they had uh, wheat plants growing in two different lysimeters. Had half the roots on one side and half the roots on the other side. They let the, those lysimeters dry out and water one side and the other side would get wet. <laughs> They'd see an increase in the moisture on the dry, in the dry lysimeter. And so at, roots can move moisture and, and so, it, and I think that's what's happening at night uh, if, uh, from your deep root zone. If you got moisture down three or four foot deep, they'll pull that moisture up during night and store it up in the top of the root system or even in the soil, and then it'll make it available during the daytime. And also, that moves by condensation. The air in the water, in the soil, is 100% 100% humidity. And so when it, at night, when the soil at the surface cools, that water falls out and condenses on the soil particles. And then the sun comes out the next day and evaporates it off. And so <clears throat> that's what happens to this pre-water that Jordan was talking, talking to us about. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the engine. Uh, plants are programmed, think about this, those corn plants, cotton plants, whatever, are programmed for maximum production. There's no difference in the corn seed that y'all plant and the corn seed that the guys plant when they're entering the National Corn Growers Contest. It's the same seed, very similar soil, same soil. That the only difference is that our production our, our production is limited by stress. It may be nitrogen or fertilizer stress. It could be temperature stress and or whatever. But the different. But plants need cooling. Now, Jordan, I've got down here that corn. If the temperature gets above the 86 degrees, it just kind of shuts down. She's shaking her head now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, if corn gets, the corn plant gets above 86 degrees, it shuts down. It stops making sugars, it stops making protein, and <clears throat> and uh, so it just kind of shuts down. And then uh, that, that maximum temperature for cotton, I have not gotten anybody to tell me what that is. I've got 95 degrees down here, is it? So I've actually heard that with cotton, it can actually be lower, closer to 90. And we always talk about cotton being a heat tolerant crop, but there's a group out in Arizona that's looking at heat tolerance in cotton and even on pollination. And because cotton pollinates over weeks because of all the different blooms, um, the effect of temperatures above 90 can actually affect pollination, which affects number of seed, you know, and, and ultimately limb production. So. Um, we're really kind of in that 90 to 95 window. And cotton pollination doesn't just occur in the morning, in the morning light, it's corn pollination. So okay. we actually have kind of a... So 90 degrees for cotton. Cool. <clears throat> okay. So, but the plant, the, 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 the point is that, that these plants need cooling. These engines need cooling systems. And plants cool by evaporation. <clears throat> At, at soil moisture temperatures, of, or soil moistures of about 75% or better, leaf temperatures may be as much as 15 degrees below ambient air temperature. Am, ambient air, you know, it may be 15 degrees below. But if the soil gets below 75%, we start seeing higher leaf temperatures. <clears throat> and if we get below 50% soil capacity, we don't see any cooling at all. And those temperatures going to be well above ambient air temperature. <clears throat> and in crops in saturated soil, y'all have seen this, with the soil, if there's corn standing in water, 
those leaves may be rolled up and anyway even at, because they're just they just can't get the water because they're there's the roots aren't very healthy <clears throat> so here is a satellite image from aqua planner this is a, a, the canopy temperature <clears throat> and in this field uh, we're corn at blister stage uh, we have 61 percent of readily available water that's different than plant available water so we're not in bad shape 61 percent is not bad <clears throat> but the average canopy temperature was 74 degrees the ambient air was 782 degrees so that is a reduction of eight degrees right is that right anyway okay and this is this is another field it's just a little bit wetter <clears throat> we have the same 82 degree ambient temperature but these corn leaves are down at 68 degrees we've got 14 degrees of cooling and so <clears throat> even though we may run up in the uh, 100 degree days if we've got good moisture out there in our corn field we can keep that corn producing if we've got good soil moisture. So with aqua planter, you'll get this kind of report. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Here is a historical evapotranspiration graph. Y'all have seen these all week. Uh, uh, factors that affect evap evapotranspiration. This is potential. Potential. The solar radiation, temperature, wind, relative humidity. There, we'll get a lot of argument about which is most important, but I, I'm, cons I, I'm convinced it's the solar radiation and temperature. I'm sure we could do the statistical analysis and figure that out. But, <clears throat> but so this de determines what the potential evaporation is. Potential evaporation. <clears throat> but then the factors that affect how much the crop actually evaporates is well we have potential evaporation is one is key factor and then what stage the crop is in and how much residue is on the on the surface of the ground because evapotranspiration in fact is evaporation from the soil and transpiration from the crop it's both of those combined it's evaporation from the soil and transpiration from the crop <clears throat> and now here's some interesting stuff factors that do not affect evapotranspiration plant population the books I read say that corn plant populations above 12,000 plants do not affect evapotranspiration <clears throat> hail damage I've had I've, I've run models on fields where the, they've got severe hail damage, but the evapotranspiration apparently was hardly affected. <clears throat> the idea is that you got that same sun burning down, and it's going to be evaporating moisture, whether it's evaporating it from the soil or from the plant. You know, <clears throat> and so you're not going to change evapotranspiration much by the uh, hail damage and skip row i don't know i i've got i i ran i had some i had some skip row cotton that we ran models on and i didn't make any adjustment in the model for this being it being skip row and we the models were pretty close <clears throat> but basically that sun's cooking down and the, and it may not it's cooking that moisture out one way or the other. <clears throat> now, there is a direct relationship of yield to transpiration. The more water we can get through that plant, the greater the yield. Okay? <clears throat> and transpiration is limited by potential evaporation and soil water availability. That's the only thing. Two things that affect that transpiration. <clears throat> so managing the soil water content 
so that crop can yield uh, is what we're after. <clears throat> okay, so here are some fuel gauges. <coughs> yeah, you're going to get over to your aqua plant pretty quick. We're on 1215, so. Okay. Don't panic yet. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get over to aqua planter soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have these fuel gauges, and a lot of us, uh, you know, we familiar with the soil probe is anybody is it been I brought five of those five from you can get these at Servitex where and I brought five with you if you don't have a, a, a soil moisture probe pick one up pick feel free to pick one up back there then we got the old bucket probe and we've got you know a pair of, a set of Harbor Freight marijuana scales but, <laughs> but and, and you know it, it's not difficult to you know go sample the soil, get take a, take grab the soil, get a sample of soil, put it in a plastic bag, weigh it, and and then dry it out in your wife in the microwave oven, and and wait you know do the gravimetric thing. You better do that while your wife's gone though. But <clears throat> but the, and you know we use the field method. Now this page is not in your book. It'll probably be what, what you can get to get from the mail on your on the thumb drive. But <clears throat> uh, you know the field method. Uh, this is just some comments on how I describe the field method and and the soil moisture probe. But I'm sure y'all better at that than I am. But <clears throat> but uh, you remember remember back when that. The, where we had that slide that had the soil moisture particles and the moisture around them, you know, in that capillary state. Well, the more moisture there is between those particles, the, the easier it is for them to slide across each other. And so <clears throat> you can get a real good indication of, of, of how much moisture is in the soil, how easy those particles slide past each other just by feeling of them. And it's, it's really, it's very accurate. <clears throat> uh, some other soil gauges, fuel, fuel gauges out there. Oops. You know, we've got soil tensiometers, so those, those deals, the ceramic plastic tube with the ceramic bulb on the bottom of it, little pressure gauge up here. We tried those on the farm. Every time I go to read them, the soil done sucked all the water out of them. So, <clears throat> and, and uh, soil moisture blocks, uh, <clears throat> and Jordan uh, is using her Newton probe, I guess, to get those soil moistures. Okay. <clears throat> then we have other electronic devices. <clears throat> uh, now, aqua planter. What is an aqua planter? Aqua planter is a forward-looking soil management tool. It has goals and objectives defined. It considers available water production capacity. You know how much how much you can produce. It maintains a current water balance, the fuel gauge. <clears throat> it anticipates the future water requirements for the crop, and it recommends irrigation applications in order to meet the soil moisture management objectives. <clears throat> Basically. How does this soil water balance work? We start out with the initial soil water content at planting time. We keep track of how much rainfall we get, how much irrigation water we put on, and how much the plant, the crop uses each day. <coughs> now, the question is, how do we get, what comes up, how do we get rainfall? We use, we're, we're connected up with the pivot track, and uh, ag sense, <clears throat> and if you got a rain bucket on your pivot sprinkler, we'll use that as the rainfall. Otherwise, we'll use radar estimated rainfall for your field. <clears throat> uh, they're, they're, it's really, really accurate. So repeat that again. What do you have to have at the field for you, this to work? Pivot track. Okay. <clears throat> okay. 
sorry, but yeah, I want to make that clear. Okay. There's some requirements that you have to have to run this bill. So. <clears throat> if you've got ag sense, we can work with ag sense. If you've got field net, those boys at field net, they won't play with this bill. <laughs> Uh, the uh, okay. So with 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 pivot track, we we know where your sprinklers at. It, we get we pull pull their database uh, <clears throat> four or eight times a day, and we get where that sprinkler's at, whether it's running or not, and we know whether <clears throat> where uh, we know how much you're pumping. So we can calculate how much you're putting on each pass. <clears throat> so you'll need a pretty good flow test too on the wells. Well, or not, uh, we just use the nozzle package. Okay. And we 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 uh, keep track of your pressure too. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is you know we just start with the initial soil water content. We keep track of the precipitation, air applied irrigation and ET <clears throat> and it results in a daily current water balance and it's reported in inches of water available <clears throat> as based on well-established science I mean they were doing this water balance since the 1950s <clears throat> uh, aqua planner is, is based on the F oops FAO drink, uh, irrigation drainage paper number 56 and <clears throat> And these research facilities, Jordan probably kept a water balance stuff on all of her plots. She did, shaking her head back here. She did it with a spreadsheet. You can do it with a spreadsheet. Back before there were spreadsheets, when we were on the farm, I did it with a piece of paper. <clears throat> it's not hard to do. <clears throat> but all Aquaplaner has done is we've incorporated new technologies and we hope we have a user-friendly web-based application just for y'all <clears throat> and some of the difference between aqua planner and these other fuel gauges is that aqua planner represents the entire field represents the entire field not just a little old six inch diameter plot of that field you know piece of that field it's that represents the entire field it's a pre-plant planting tool we can run aqua planter models on your fields that you're going to plant now <clears throat> and we can play with planting dates we can play with uh, uh, splitting the field in half planting half of it early half of it late we can we can see okay what if we plant a half of the cotton and half of the corn we can simulate all that stuff today we don't have to wait till we get it planted <clears throat> we can do some management before we get the seed in the ground <clears throat> so and basically aqua planter meets all the needs of an irrigation manager meets all of them. so uh uh, yeah, I was going to skip that. Okay, so how do we do that? Okay, <clears throat> here's an, one of the reports that is available at Oaxaca Planner. And we've got corn. Uh, it has just emerged. The system is off. We can put on 20 hundredths of an inch per day. Seven day forecast is for 0.46 inches and our, our soil profile is about 80% full. <clears throat> uh, there is room in the profile for one and a half inches of water. <clears throat> and Aquapainer is recommending an inch and a quarter pass. So, but, <clears throat> it, we have what we're gonna call a critical management point as one of our objectives. We'll develop that in a minute. But one of our, our, object, our management Objective is to have 100% full at this point in time, and Aquaplaner calculates that we're going to be there in 32 days. We're going to be at 10 leaves in 43 days, and at that time, we'd like to have 100% faster. We'd like to be full. And same with these other objectives. 
Uh, <clears throat> we calculate the number of days till we get there. This is the amount of water that's required. They're gonna, yeah, to, what the, the crop is gonna use 4.44 inches in those 32 days, but we've gotta make up this uh, inch and a half over here. So in order to meet that requirement, we're gonna have to put 0.19 inches per day. We can look at that 0.19, compare it to what we can, what we can produce, and decide whether, make the decision whether we should, we should be watering that crop. We spend, <clears throat> right now the recommendation is on. Whoops, <clears throat> is on. So you can see how Octaplaner is a forward-looking irrigation management tool. <clears throat> you can log on anytime to see these reports, right? Yes. If you subscribe. Okay. Right. Uh, this is a graph that we produce. It's very busy. I get all kinds of complaints about there being too much information on here, but we've got the crop going across the top. This is where the uh, system is on when it's in, in green. <clears throat> uh, this is the root zone or the, the, the fuel tank that's available to the crop at each, each day. And then this is the, the level. This is the fuel gauge. This is how much, how much water we've got in the soil. And this pink line represents all this is is not this is readily available water and this is below 50 percent this if we get into this area we're we're, we're losing money <clears throat> okay uh this rip down here is the below the root zone and the blue area is water that's available down there once the roots get to it this white area is uh <clears throat> is indicates how much we have depleted below the root zone. This graph down here is uh, at ET, and it's on, it's on this scale over here on the right side. The scale is inches, this scale is inches of water depleted. My new, the latest, this was back in 1912, or 1912. <laughs> I have changed this scale to where it is inches of water available and just inverted it. Just inverted this scale. Well, I'll, I'll admit, when you get this, you, you'll get used to reading it. And there'll be parts of this that you'll want to pick out and follow, even though it's all together. Now, he, you'll get a summary of each part of these lines in different reports along with this. So, if you want to break it down, there'll be separate reports than this total graph. This puts it all together, but you'll get other side reports with this to help make sense of it. Yeah. Uh, and you'll get used to reading it. I know right now you see this, that's kind of busy, but you know that black squiggly line, each one of those green lines going up is where you're irrigating. And uh, those are planned spring planned irrigations. Yeah. They're not scheduled. They're planned. <laughs> right. But you'll, you'll get used to reading this, is what I'm saying. And if you look across the top, you'll be able to follow what your crop growth stage should be at these various times of water management. Okay. So this is what it looks like during the mid-season, in the middle of the season. This uh, gray line right here, that's the divider point. Everything back behind this is history. Everything in front of it is uh, future. Okay. And that line moves every day. It does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you got what you actually did to the left, and what should happen to to the front now. Okay. Yeah. And okay. that'll help you a bunch as you go, because it's gathering the data as you irrigate, and you'll have actual good records of daily rainfall, irrigations, and all that throughout the season. So that's real helpful. Mm -hmm you'll get reports on the side along with this graph. If you'll notice down here, this, even this future evapotranspiration is a little bit squiggly. But we take, we take the uh, five day forecast and we adjust the evapotranspiration, expected draft evapotranspiration by the, by the forecast, by the 10 day forecast. <clears throat> 
And so uh, we're adjusting as we go. We also keep track of the soil in each foot of the profile, top foot, second foot, third foot, fourth foot. <clears throat> I want to talk to you about this critical management point. We introduced it a while ago. This critical management point is where the evapotranspiration exceeds, first exceeds our pumping capacity. And in the examples we're going to be using, we're talking about a 700 gallon a minute system. <clears throat> uh, and kind of read this simulator here. We've got our ET going here. This gray line represents our critical management point. This gray line is black layer, as we're, we're done, we're, we're mature there. And down here, we're gonna, we're, uh, uh, these, these are uh, irrigation applications. So we planted a crop, we put on an inch of water to get, get the crop started. <clears throat> And so the question is, when do we start the sprinkler? When do we start the sprinkler? When do we start right here? Well, if we're just arbitrary and guessing, we're likely to miss it. I mean, if we're just guessing. <clears throat> but aquaplanner can calculate ahead of time when we're gonna get to that point, how much the moisture the crop's gonna be using during this time and calculate backwards when we need to start that sprinkler in order to achieve that objective. What we learned in Epic, the growers will naturally be ahead of that. We, we use this tool to push it to the limit on that, but that's where we got our irrigation savings, if that makes sense, right there at the front. We also found we got a little bit extra root development on our corn, that's where we're, I'm thinking that's where we got our yield bumps. So it kind of gives you the confidence that, and I know it's kind of scary to say, whoa, we'll just hold off a minute. But it gave us the confidence to do that. And then there's a point in there, okay, turn loose, water. Okay, so we fired a sprinkler up here and we kept this line in the green. We kept this uh, <clears throat> crop in the green all, all summer long. We, got, we were able to calculate when the, we were gonna get the black layer and calculate a cutoff date, <clears throat> okay? Uh, if we're one week late getting started, if we're one week late getting started, just seven days on a 700 gallon a minute well, <clears throat> we miss our critical management point, we end up down here in the pink while we're trying to fill the grain on that, that that year, and we end up having to water all the way to black layer. We didn't save any water. <clears throat> we just exposed our crop to moisture stress. We just exposed, that's all we accomplished. <clears throat> yeah, you can push it over the edge. <laughs> if, if we start a week early, we end up pushing about two inches of water through the profile and washing the mineral or, or fertilizer down and we still end up having to water just as long <clears throat> and what we see a lot of well, guys will start early and they'll water all the way to black layer and by the time that crop harvest that water is gone so they're not saving any water for the next crop by watering all the way to black layer <clears throat> if anything this tool will help you I get a lot of calls, you know, when do I shut off? If you use this tool for anything, it'll help you a lot there. It's when to cut off. <clears throat> Here's a, an example, this is 2011. This producer, uh, we, we hit the critical management point pretty well. We were able to stay in the green all summer long. <clears throat> Here's a field that didn't. These guys were off water and wheat. I don't know what they were doing, but they missed the critical management point. <clears throat> and they were in the pink all summer long. <clears throat> and if you'll notice, they were there's one inch, two inches of they were behind in, in the in the root zone. Below the root zone, they were behind another about another inch and a quarter. And if you'll take 
and they had one, two, three inches, they would have been they would have been able to stay up in the pink too, or stay in the green, if they had hit that critical mass point. Yeah. <clears throat> this field made 268 bushels in 2011. This field made 168 bushels. <clears throat> yeah. Get that again. Were they both similar to gallon wells? Yes. I hate to do it to you, but we're past. Okay. Cat will be around. Anyway, y'all get yeah. this is an example of an email report the producers get every day. You get an email report, you can log on, you get your own log on. How much does it cost, Pat? Oh, I have <laughs> three. <laughs> I have been. Records. I have been charging two dollars an acre, dependent, but we can design a service for you at my fact probably less than that. <clears throat> we can design a service for you that's probably less than that. Yeah, if I recommend anything, at least put it on one circle. You know. No, oh, don't put it on this one. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean just a good start. It's better than nothing. You know, you'll get used to reading those reports. Okay, Pat and Scott will be around all day, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, Aqua Spy. I have not even mentioned them. You saw them in the deal. They are uh, providing lunch and have been providing the donuts and that. 